I am happy to introduce Elizabeth Krauss, who's going to be talking about cosmology in 2021, concordances and tensions. And again, I'll give you a five minute warning at 25 minutes after we start. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited um, to speak to you um, on behalf of the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration, uh, starting out with an overview of the current state of cosmology and then ad advertising our upcoming DES year three results. So uh, in this talk, I will focus on the observational perspective uh, on cosmology uh, rather than um, the state of the art theoretical models for some of the details in this picture, which means that um, I will be working in a vanilla or I'll be talking to you about the vanilla cosmology model, where on large scales, we can describe the universe with remarkably few parameters. That is, uh, we want to measure the age of the universe, the geometry of space, the density of atoms, the density of matter, the amplitude of fluctuations, and the scale dependence of these fluctuations. Of course, the details are not quite as simple, or we wouldn't be here. And you will hear about some of these details uh, in the um, really interesting upcoming uh, four cosmology parallel sessions. Uh, but let's stick with this simple model for now. Within these parameters, uh, we can describe uh, the universe um, really remarkably well, uh, starting out, of course, uh, with a big bang, um, quantum, fluctuations, quantum uh, fluctuations being amplified during a process we call inflation, uh, see, um, and then providing the initial seeds for the growth of structure in the universe. At, the, at that point, at the end of inflation, um, the universe um, is in a very hot, dense plasma that is uh, expanding along, cooling off, um, and gravity does its work. Eventually, the um, universe uh, becomes cold enough that uh, photons can travel freely. At that point, we see the afterglow light of the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background. And then over time, gravity does its work until uh, the first galaxies um, in cosmic structure form. And then they continue to grow over time uh, into the um, cosmic filaments, planets, and um, everything we see today. And you already see uh, indicated uh, in this um, di nice diagram here by NASA that uh, at late times, we can see the size of the universe increasing. It starts, that um, increase starts to accelerate uh, with a phenomenon that we've termed dark energy. And that brings me to the constituents of this um, vanilla cosmology model where we have about 5% matter as we know it, then another 25% in dark matter that you heard about in the previous plenary session. And the remaining 70% uh, of the energy budget today have been termed dark energy. Uh, this is what we believe uh, accelerates the expansion of the universe. And uh, that was first measured in the late, late 1990s. Now our frontier, next frontier is to understand what this dark energy is. And the simplest model there would be a cosmological constant, lambda, with equation of state uh, of minus one. Uh, but in that uh, simplest picture, uh, the size of um, this cosmological constant is difficult to explain with theory and um, observations differing by 40 or 120 orders of magnitude, depending on how you count. The um, next more complicated uh, model then would be a dynamic scalar, scalar field, at which point our equation of state W um, acquires a time dependence or dark energy might also mean that we are witnessing a breakdown of general relativity. Sol Permuter, uh, one of the uh, novelists for the discovery of dark energy um, has proved that there has been about one paper on the archive um, with a new model for dark energy since it was discovered. So uh, from the observational side, uh, we don't go through each of these models one at a time generally um, to test them, but rather uh, we uh, want to make progress by stress testing our vanilla model and asking aggregate questions. That is, uh, we ask whether data from the early and late universe can be fit by the same parameters in our simple model, uh, whether measurements of the expansion history uh, and growth of structure uh, agree. I'll get to that next. And then if we want to ask one more question about dark energy, we ask whether uh, this we um, set out to measure the equation of state um, and see whether it uh, changes as space expands. So let's get to it. 
Um, let's start with the expansion history, uh, where we um, um, measure distances to objects in the universe as a function of redshift, uh, another um, indicator for um, the age of the universe or, um, or time evolution. Then um, there we have two options. One is standard candle and, uh, and the other are standard rulers. Uh, both uh, indicated nicely here um, uh, in this example of streetlights, where if you uh, know how uh, um, luminous a streetlight uh, intrinsically is, you have some idea of guessing whether it's near or far. Similar, um, if you know its size, you can also um, estimate the distance. And we do the same with cosmological objects. Here, yeah, our standard candle um, are supernovae. That is a, a sources with known luminosity, uh, which in the case of supernovae, we can determine from their um, duration and color. Um, in the top plot here, um, I show you um, a recent compilation of um, uh, apparent uh, magnitude measurements um, if, um, of supernovae as a function of redshift. And at the bottom, uh, the residual between the measurement and predictions based on our vanilla model parameters um, fit to the early universe. So that shows you that here um, in this lower panel, um, our vanilla lambda CDM model can predict both uh, the uh, early universe uh, and uh, supernovae, um, apparent brightness of supernovae with the same parameters. Then um, for our standard ruler, we have the sound horizon in the early universe that we measure um, as peaks in the cosmic microwave background temperature spectrum. And then we can also measure that same scale uh, imprinted in the late time galaxy um, distribution called baryonic acoustic oscillations. And uh, again, the confrontation of early and late universe here is shown in the bottom panel, showing you uh, recent BEO measurements compared to, um, to their prediction based again on parameters fit to the cosmic microwave background. So within our um, vanilla lambda CDM model, uh, these measurements are consistent um, and they tightly constrain um, spatial flatness and the matter density. And uh, these measurements in the early 2000s led to what's called concordance cosmology, uh, confronting three different types of expansion history measurements. We have the cosmic microwave background, um, shown here in orange, in the space of matter density and like energy density. Then in green, our standard ruler, the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Uh, and in blue, uh, the standard candle supernovae. Uh, you can see that all these measurements have um, somewhat different degeneracies, uh, but um, measurements found this beautiful uh, concordance between the three different types of expansion history measurements. Since then, of course, we've gotten much more data and things have gotten more interesting. Uh, in particular, um, there's been great progress uh, in calibrating the distance ladder. So far, we've talked about um, uh, using um, supernovae in distant galaxies uh, as standard candles. Of course, uh, these standard candles need to be calibrated. Uh, and for that, astronomers use uh, the distance ladder starting out with uh, geometric techniques, making the step to the Magellanic Cloud, uh, where we um, then um, observe Cepheids, variable stars, uh, and the um, period luminosity relation, and then using those to make the step uh, to uh, galaxies hosting Cepheids and supernovae. And thanks to uh, recent uh, progress uh, on this uh, local calibration of the distance ladder, uh, uh, we are now seeing um, an intriguing and uh, by now significant tension um, in the Hubble parameter is measured from the early universe shown on top here uh, from the cosmic microwave background. And then using uh, geometric measurements uh, in the late universe um, and variable stars. And you can see that already uh, by eye here that uh, these um, different types of measurements bifurcate. Uh, and if you then split them um, uh, into or combine them in the early and late um, category, you end up with um, a tension of order five um, to six sigma. So this is becoming significant now. And um, theoretical models are abound. Uh, I am sure there will be several um, conferences this summer again um, discussing um, 
models um, for the um, Hubble parameter tension. Um, it is far from con conclusive yet, and I will uh, uh, again advertise some of the talks in the parallel cosmology sessions um, for starting to um, make sense of it. This is uh, definitely a crisis for our um, simple lambda CDM model. So, so far we've only talked about expansion history measurements. The next ingredient then is um, growth of structure. Uh, when we have um, several uh, different observational windows on the growth of late time um, structure, retro space distortions, cosmic shear, galaxy clustering, galaxy clusters. And the question there is, do all these measurements agree with predictions in the same fiducial lambda CDM model compared to, again, our three um, expansion history measurements um, that brought us um, beautiful concordance cosmology. And um, the plot here on the right now shows the compilation of um, weak lensing measurements that I'll get to in a bit um, versus the early universe as measured by Planck, shown in red. And here we have um, the meta density versus S8 uh, and, um, um, and amplitude of structure growth. And you can see that these three different curves here from independent color, um, colorations all fall to the same side um, of the cosmic microwave background measurement. Individually, these are each at the level of um, order two, two and a half sigma um, um, of, uh, from uh, what Planck finds. So these uh, by now um, are not sig as significant as the Hubble parameter yet, but there's uh, hints at possible tensions between early and late universe physics. Um, and of course, a very interesting question will be to ask whether these two effects are related, but to make progress, uh, we first have to uh, shrink um, the error bars here on the right to the, um, decide whether it was a statistical fluke um, or uh, an emerging tension. So let me briefly talk about um, how that's done. That is, we now turn to photometric large structure surveys. And I'm giving you here an overview of uh, different experiments um, as a function of um, year in which they operate. They're showing in blue their survey area. So the area uh, mapped on the sky in square degrees. And then up here, uh, the number of galaxies observed per square arc minute, which is um, a measure of survey depth. Right now, we are uh, in an in era where we have uh, three um, experiments in friendly competition, the kilo degree survey, the dark energy survey, and hyper subprime cam, all following slightly different um, survey strategies, uh, analyzing of order tens to 100 million galaxies. Uh, but these are really the boot camp to prepare us for uh, later on um, handling and making sense of the massive data sets coming to our hard drives um, in the mid 2020s. At which point we'll be analyzing tens of billions of galaxies. So the basic idea here is that gra gravity drives cosmic structure formation and dark energy or whatever cosmic acceleration is slows it down. This is a measurement that's uh, complementary to, ex to expansion rate. I, on very large scales, we can make progress with a paper and pencil using perturbation theory. However, uh, to really interpret um, the filamentary structure um, of the universe, uh, we will need nonlinear evolu evolution and turn to uh, numerical simulations. These then allow us to reliably predict the dark matter distribution for um, select um, um, dark energy models as a function of time. And at the bottom here, I'm showing you one example uh, from when the universe was about 2 billion years old to today of uh, uh, this filamentary structure growing in um, gravity only simulation. Of course, the problem then is that this dark matter distribution is not directly observable. Um, and we still need to connect theory to observations. So that means after we've run our, dark uh, of our, our um, gravity's uh, only simulation, then still all of astrophysics has to happen um, to tell us where galaxies and light are. And uh, we need to um, compare to um, our observations, which might like, look like this, uh, for galaxy positions, shapes, and colors from the photometric surveys. Uh, that could, um, we could compare to CMB temperature and polarization and other, other traces. So typically, we do that through uh, summary statistics. We don't compare one map to an, a simulated map to um, an observed map, uh, but we compress this information uh, into um, two-point correlation functions, uh, looking at the biggest over-densities in the um, uh, filaments, 
we can study the under densities of um, we're really ambitious, we can also um, um, turn to triplets of galaxies or, or, or traces. The workhorse in this cosmology, um, uh, in these um, photometric um, as, as surveys, uh, is the two point correlation function. That is uh, the access probability of finding galaxy pairs as a function of separation. Uh, this simple measurement uh, then um, is nicely related uh, to the meta power spectrum, assuming that we um, have a model for the relation between galaxy density and dark matter density, called galaxy bias and a large area of astrophysics. Uh, here, then, you see uh, the meta power spectrum um, with, of course, large spatial scales over at low um, Fourier modes, uh, small spatial scales over here on the right, and showing you. Uh, the evolution from redshift three uh, to today. Here uh, on very um, large spatial scales, the change in amplitude is the linear growth that we could uh, predict with paper and pencil. And then down over here is non-linear non structure uh, where most of the signal to noise is. Our other measurement is uh, gravitational lensing, um, using that um, curved space-time tells uh, light how to move uh, and thus distorting uh, the shape of background galaxies. You've um, probably all seen these beautiful images of strong lensing, uh, where um, a galaxy um, behind a very massive overdensity um, is smeared out uh, in these beautiful arcs. I'll focus here on weak lensing, uh, which is uh, the um, coherent uh, distortion of galaxy shapes, uh, aligning them um, tangentially uh, with, with filaments. Here's a strong acceleration, showing you what happens to circular background galaxies um, amplifying the relensing effect by about a factor 100. And then you can um, notice here how these um, cyan galaxies align tangentially with the dark matter overdensities. In reality, of course, our galaxies uh, don't have such a nice contrast um, to the sky. Uh, and we're doing this measurement uh, with weak lensing being about a factor 100 smaller. And the signal to noise is about 20 per galaxy. So just um, um, as one example, there's about 100,000 galaxies for which we do weak lensing measurements in this image. So that's a very different uh, regime uh, than the nice cartoon before. Now for worked example, the DESU1 analysis, which used 26 million galaxies, um, combining galaxy clustering from about uh, 600,000 galaxies with um, um, good redshifts, so that we have a, um, spatial resolution along the line of sight for galaxy clustering and we're cleansing for 26 million um, source galaxies split into broader um, bins along the line of sight. And then we look at um, the autocorrelation of both effects and their cross-correlation called galaxy-galaxy lensing. Of course, then we need more than just our vanilla um, cosmology parameters to describe this measurement. There's a lot of astrophysics not included uh, in the Lambda CDM model. That is, uh, we have to uh, describe the relation between um, galaxy density and meta density, which we do through a galaxy bias. We have to describe the intrinsic shapes of galaxies called intrinsic alignments uh, and take care of a lot of um, observational effects. We ended up with a minimal uh, parameterization of 20 parameters uh, and wait, went through great lengths showing that this parameterization is sufficient for our year one analysis. Um, after all those tests, uh, <clears throat> we were able to measure or constrain the meta density and amplitude of structure growth from weak lensing only, and the combination of galaxy cluster and galaxy galaxy lensing. So two splits of our measurement. Because we found these two to be consistent, we're allowed to combine to get these um, blue joint contours. And the important point here is that while I show you two parameters, keep in mind that they are marginalized over the four other cosmology parameters uh, and um, 20 uh, systematics parameters. Now, of course, the big question is, um, do early and late universe agree? And you can see here the comparison of our measurement versus uh, constraints from Planck, again, cosmic microwave background early um, universe. And um, this is one of the many measurements two, two dot odd uh, sigma um, away from um, the early universe measurement, which means we need to observe more galaxies, combine more different measurements and achieve better systematics control. And uh, to show you that opportunity space, um, let me um, discuss this rogue analysis by Anthony Lewis, um, taking our DSU1 data vector, analyzing it um, with all systematic parameters fixed, 
So the comparison between gray and red shows you the potential gain if our current systematics model could be completely constrained from external data. And then uh, in blue, what would also happen if we didn't have to throw out um, most of the signal to noise due to modeling uncertainties. So uh, there's a tremendous opportunity space. Uh, we need more external astrophysics constraints and new parameterizations to unlock some of it. As one quick work example, let me tell you about baryonic effects and reglensing analyses. We can uh, see here the formation of um, halos in a um, hydro simulation now with different um, star formation and feedback um, um, prescriptions. And importantly, um, all this feedback from um, accretion onto black holes and uh, active galactic nuclei um, feeding back energy into surroundings means that matter gets redistributed and halos become puffier. That means that uh, that is the uh, reason uh, for cosmology analysis to throw out weak lensing information on small scales, because we are un uh, unsure how to model baryonic effects um, uh, on the matter power spectrum. And you can see here measurements from the DSC1 analysis and underlaid in gray, all those data points that we throw out um, in the baseline analysis due to modeling uncertainties. Now, uh, Hong Jun Huang, uh, reanalyze this data, including all big lensing measurements down to two and a half, um, down um, to the left of this plot. So including all the measurements uh, by uh, incorporating a baryonic model. Here's an example of um, what feedback in simulations does to the matter power spectrum, comparing the matter power spectrum measured in hydro simulations to gravity only simulations. And you can see that it's uh, of order a 30, 40% effect uh, on small scales. And uh, importantly, uh, these simulations bracket a range of um, baryonic scenarios broader than we expect um, the true universe to be. So um, where we can build um, a continuous baryonic uh, prioritization um, using a principal component analysis of the simulations. And then apply that, use that in, in the cosmology analysis. So in orange here, um, I repeat the DES uh, baseline analysis that, you, that I showed you before. Then in green, including all the scales, but not modeling baryons. So don't do that. Uh, we know that uh, we need baryons to model these small scales, which is um, why this green contour is shifted. And you can, but you can see that we would gain tremendously in constraining power. Then the blue contour includes um, non-informative priors on baryonic effects meaning that uh, now we include all the data points, but model variants very conservatively uh, and don't gain much. Um, if we then include a moderately um, informative prior uh, on our variant parameters by saying certain simulations are already ruled out by X-ray observations, um, then we arrive at this gray contour showing um, of order a 20% uh, gain in constraining power on S8. And the idea is that we can make further progress here by confronting uh, with more um, external data sets such as um, TSC and X-ray. Further tightening these priors, increasing the constraining power on this eight. And the name of the game here really is systematics control. So with that, let me advertise the upcoming DSGS3 analysis. Uh, that is an analysis of the full survey area, uh, almost 5,000 square degrees. Uh, and we will present this in a webinar on Thursday at 11.30 uh, a.m. Eastern. Um, I've uh, uh, included the Zoom link uh, in my next conclusion slide. So here we are analyzing the full area um, uh, and increased depth compared to the concern that I just showed you. And importantly, uh, there's algorithmic and modeling improvements in all analysis stages. So this flowchart here uh, shows you how the uh, final um, cosmology analysis it's built up on 28 supporting papers, each developing um, one step of the um, um, analysis, going from um, wide field images um, to um, point spread function modeling and uh, shear measurements, how to combine um, deep field photometry with wide field imaging uh, to calibrate redshifts, um, and going through, then of course, going through a bunch of astrophysical modeling later on. So I hope um, you uh, will still have bandwidth for another day of uh, Zoom after this conference is, uh, um, or another Zoom talk after this conference is over. I hope you'll join us um, on Thursday at 11.30.
So with that, uh, let me conclude. Uh, the simple six parameter Lambda CDM model has been remarkably successful at describing a wide range of cosmological epochs and observables. However, intriguing tensions and fluctuations are emerging, in particular, uh, the H0 tension, uh, which is um, significant by now, uh, and uh, intriguing fluctuations uh, in the amplitude of structural growth as H. Um, most cosmological con constraints uh, on these parameters are systematics limited, meaning that we really um, require accurate astrophysics and systematic formulations and priors, which is what most of us are working on. And uh, the upcoming DESG3 results uh, will improve um, our constraining power by about a factor of two. And I hope you'll join us um, uh, at 11.30 on Thursday. And just one more comment looking forward beyond these analyses. I told you um, it's all in the systematics uh, and uh, to make progress, we need to calibrate them, which means really we have to collaborate across different surveys and across different wavelengths. Uh, and um, we should all be talking to each other and planning for analysis frameworks to combine data uh, going forward. This doesn't happen by chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, I would like to again invite audience to um, feel free to ask some questions. Um, we don't have any at the moment. Um, I'm very excited about the Thursday seminar and <laughs> I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. And I think we'll all be also looking forward to it. Um, 